Krakows for leading our song service. And thank you, brothers and sisters, for joining us here for our week of prayer. This is our first day of our week of prayer. At the same time, this is like our fifth day of our 10 days of prayer. It's such a beautiful sight to behold for God's people who are hungry to come together, to bow before Him, and to seek for the outpouring of His Spirit. Amen? The Lord has promised that where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of Him. And to see right now that there's more than two, <laughs> that there's more than three, it just gives so much joy in my heart that my cheekbones is going to hurt smiling tonight. <laughs> so before we go into our, our time of uh, devotion, into our time of prayer, may I request those who are able to kneel down to please kneel down with me for a word of prayer. Our great God, our dear loving Heavenly Father, our desire is to be in your presence. And Lord, we ask that uh, may you prepare our hearts that we may be able to receive what it is that you want to give us. Lord, I ask that may your spirit be upon us. Your holy angels, Lord, surround this place. And dear Father, I ask in a very special way that may you speak to each and every heart right now, especially my heart. And may only words that will be spoken will be yours. And friends, let's, uh, let's turn to the person nearest us. Let's spend this, this one minute Let's just pray that the Holy Spirit will, will prepare us, will empower us, most especially uh, will revive us as we begin this uh, week of prayer and as we continue on with these 10 days of prayer. We may begin our prayers. Let's turn to the person next to us. And let us pray for one another. And at the end of one minute, I'll sing a song and I'll end our time of prayer. Into my heart, into my heart, come into my heart, Lord Jesus, come in today, come in to stay. To my heart, Lord Jesus. Dear Father, we invite, invite the Holy Spirit to come into our hearts. And Lord, I pray that may our thoughts be centered upon you. And may our eyes be fixed upon the one whose eyes is fixed on us. Thank you so much, Lord, for hearing our prayers. We pray all this in the loving name of your Son, Jesus, all your children say, Amen. Again, friends, uh, good afternoon. I'm tempted to say happy Sabbath. <laughs> it is always, like we're imagining, it's always Sabbath when we gather together and pray. Just imagine what heaven will be like. <laughs> It's going to be Sabbath every day, amen? And especially those people who are here are those people who can't wait to be in heaven, who can't wait to be in the presence of Jesus. So before we go on into our first day of week of prayer, at the same time, this is like our day number five of our 10 days of prayer. So we're going we're gonna to mix this up a bit. 
uh, I love the theme for our 10 days of prayer this year, seeking revival. Can you say amen to that? And I believe what is happening to our world right now is really pushing us to desire for something better than what we desire before. God is wanting us to see beyond what we were like being comfortable before. God is wanting us to see what's really important, what really matters. So I love this beautiful quote, quote from Selected Messages, page, a uh, book one, page 121. It says here, a revival of true godliness among us is the greatest and most urgent of all our needs. To seek this should be our very first work. And I believe during, before COVID, this was not our, our top priority. You believe so? Would you agree? Huh? This was not our top priority. Our top priority is somehow just wanting to survive, wanting to thrive. But revival is not really one of our it did not make our, our top 10, maybe top 20 or top 50, but not really top in that category. But because of what happened to us right now, what is happening around us, we are seeking for something that is way, way bigger than what we're seeking for. So I would really declare that God is good. Amen? That even in the situations that we're facing right now, God is bringing us into a point of really asking for things that would bring us closer to Him. And friends, it says here, there must be an earnest effort to obtain the blessing of the Lord, not because that God is not willing to bestow His blessing upon us, but because we are unprepared to receive it. I believe, friends, there are a lot of prayers for this for this matter that was being lifted up in, two, in 2020 more than any other years before. Would you say amen? A lot of people were calling out in the name of God. Even atheists were calling out in the name of God. Check their membership, it reduced. A lot of people were calling on the name of God, friends. But listen to this beautiful thought here. It is our, er, it is our work by confession humiliation, repentance, and earnest prayer to fulfill the conditions upon which God has promised to grant us His blessings. A revival need be expected only in answer to what? Prayer. Only in answer to prayer. But what type of prayer? Again, let me go back to that line there. It is our work by confession. Humiliation repentance and earnest prayer to fulfill the conditions upon which God has promised. In answer to that type of prayer, revival might be expected. Friends, before COVID, we are, we are a proud group of people. We are a proud nation. Or maybe we are a proud church. But COVID changed all that. We begin to realize that we need to humble ourselves upon, before the presence of God. And that's one of the biggest blessings, friends. That's one of the biggest blessings that I see that 2020 has brought us into. So there's this one illustration that my friend always bring out. And I always like using that, especially when we talk about revival. I believe you heard this. There's one person who, who asks his pastor, Pastor, why is there not revival in our time right now? Why is not the Holy Spirit being poured out the way it was poured out in the time of Pentecost? The pastor told him, just come here to the church tomorrow and I'll, I'll explain. And the person came to the church at the exact time that the pastor has appointed. And he brought him to the baptistry. And the guy was thinking, oh, maybe he will rebaptize me. So... The pastor held him and put him down. And I guess a few more seconds, he was thinking, maybe this is the time he will bring me up and I will be revived. But you know what? The pastor held him there. And this guy was, was somehow trying to panic, but he was trusting the pastor. He's the pastor. He, was, he will not drown me. But a few more seconds passed by. The pastor was still putting him down. And when he looked at it, he saw the pastor's eyes, like, not really 
planning to bring him up. And now he had that struggle. He was struggling. He was even grabbing to the pastor's arms. And later on, the pastor brought him out and he said, what were you trying to do? And this is what the pastor said. When you are as desperate for revival as you were just now for the next breath, then the Lord will send revival. If we are as desperate for that next breath, like that man, imagine you are that man, and that a time, the Lord will send revival. A friend of mine who was driving me in Michigan, by the way, for those of you who do not know, I don't know how to drive. <laughs> I was born to be driven. So, so he was driving me, and he was asking me, yeah, Brother Jem, why don't we experience such powerful revival experiences in the times of the pioneers, in the times of the disciples right now, in our prayer meetings, when we gather together? And, uh, and I, it somehow hit me, that question hit me, and I was thinking, why? Yes, there are a lot of people now who are praying, but why don't we experience that? And I realized, friends, in our prayer meetings, are we really desperate to seek for revival? Or is it just another meeting that we have to come together so that people will know that we are having a meeting in the church? We're, giving a, we're given a, a material, and we read it 15 minutes before, or sometimes a day before. The question is, are we even desperate to bring revival to our church? that we could not sleep, that we bring it to the presence of God. Lord, please pour your spirit upon this. And then I talked to him. Are we as desperate as the disciples were? When Jesus ascended, are we as desperate as the pioneers, pioneers were? I'm thinking, we are not. We are so used to the drive-through. Everything is drive-through. Everything is in it's instant. So, and I believe, friends, I believe 2020, God really taught us to be desperate. Can you say amen? Oh, the amen now is, is getting tired. <laughs> friends, I believe God is somehow preparing His church. God is preparing you and me for something that is bigger than what happened in 2020. He wants to shine through each and every one of us. And 2020 happened as, as a fire drill for what he wants to accomplish for his people. So I'd like to share with you other the little things that I've learned in 2020. Actually, I was preparing a different talk before I stood up. And the Lord brought me back to another topic. So I could not resist. So do not blame me. Blame the Lord. So I was, uh, I, for those of you who do not know, I have been a missionary for the past 10 years and two months. And the Lord has taught me to, two months, oh, three months, friends, three months. Yes, 10 years and three months. And the Lord has taught me to rely upon Him for everything. Just everything, friends. And God somehow made that clear in my head that if He... If I did not listen to him in those few years, in those nine years of the way that he has been teaching me, I would not have survived 2020. Yes, friends, I would have been a little Filipino missionary paranoid. I would have a heart attack. I would have been depressed. But because of the Lord trying to teach me to lean on him fully, that's how I survived. And God has been good. Amen? Amen. So friends, question, who is our greatest example that we need to follow? Jesus. Jesus. Who among you here does not agree with that? Okay, praise God. Everyone agrees. Maybe I did not give enough time. Hopefully no one will raise their hand. So Jesus, listen to this, friends. It says here, Jesus, Christ in his life on earth made no plans for himself. He did not make plans for himself. And then I realized, friends, that most of our plans during 2020 just fell apart. 
No? Most of our plans in 2020 just fell apart. Like weddings have been postponed. Some of them have been canceled. Some of my friends' weddings have been totally canceled. Some, some relationship broke up. And I was, I was excited to, to preach, in a, uh, to, to speak in a graduation back home. This is my first college graduation that I'll be a speaker. And graduation did not happen. Even GC session was postponed. Everything was postponed. All the plans that we had was somehow pushed through, uh, pushed through, no, fall apart. And I realized, friends, that the only plan that went through was God's plan. And just come to think of it, God has a plan for each one of us. And then I realized when I look back in 2020, the Lord showed us that no matter how much we plan, if it's not in accordance to His will, it will, it will not push through. So, but listen to this, friends. What did Christ do? He accepted God's plan for Him, and day by day, the Father unfolded His plans. This is what Christ did. Day by day, the Father, what? Unfolded his plans to him. And one person told me, but Jem, that's Christ. You are not Christ. The quote is not finished. It says here, so should we. So should we depend upon God that our lives may be the simple outworking of his will. And as we commit our ways to him, he will direct our steps. Friends, Come to think of it, if the one who's leading your steps is the one who is the way, the truth, and the life, will you ever get lost? No, never. And friends, as we commit our ways to Him, He will direct our steps. Just imagine God directing your steps. Question, who among you here got lost with the direction of Google Maps or Waze or Siri? Mm -hmm. Yes, I guess most of us or all of us, we got lost, but God will never get you lost. Can you say amen? Amen. God will never get us lost. And it says here, too many in planning for a brilliant future make an utter failure. Friends, does this quote was made real during 2020? <laughs> too many in planning for a brilliant future make an utter failure. And it says here, let God plan for you. Let God plan for you. And when I look back, friends, when I look back, it was not my plans that was really pushed through. It was God's plan. In the past 10 years and three months that God has been leading my life, it was not because of, of my ways, but it was because of God's ways. So the Lord just brought back my attention to the reality that without him I am nothing and I begin to lean again on the Lord and I said Lord I'm sorry I was tempted to to make my own way but your ways are still perfect and uh, friends you know what I believe that uh, that God allowed one of the biggest storms to happen in our lives to stop us in our tracks because we're not even realizing that it's not God's ways anymore. Sometimes it's easy to somehow deviate from that thinking that we are still following God, but we are doing an autopilot already. And friends, I like this thought here that I'd like to share with you because this somehow gave me so much peace in the midst of COVID. And from the book prayer, page 226, paragraph 5, it says, if you have given yourself to God to do His work, you have no need to be anxious for tomorrow. Wow. If you have given yourself to God to do His work, you have no need to be anxious for tomorrow. Friends, as a church, as a chosen people of God, we should be the most peaceful people. Huh? We should be the anxiety-free group of people. It says here, He whose servant you are, remember who your God is, knows the end from the beginning. Can you say amen? 
He knows the end from what? From the beginning. The events of tomorrow which are hidden from your view are open to the eyes of Him who is omnipotent. Friends, how can we be afraid of tomorrow when God has been there? How can we be afraid of tomorrow when God is our tomorrow? Isn't that crazy? It's so simple, my dear friends, but we often, often forget. We have a God, friends. We have a God who knows the numbers of the hairs on your head. Who among you here counts your eyelashes? Why? You're saying, no, why aren't you counting your eyelashes? And people will tell me, Jem, who cares? <laughs> and I tell them, God does. He knows the number of your hair. He knows the number of your falling hair. Just imagine, friends, if you know that you have a God like that, how can you be worried about what tomorrow will bring as long as you know that you have given your all to Him? Friends, listen to this beautiful Beautiful thought here. Nothing surprises God. Did you hear this? 2020 did not surprise God. Amen? Friends, one thing that I realized, because, forgive me, friends, this is one of my habits with my good friends. I always want to hide behind them and then shock them. You could not shock God. You could not hide behind Him. And say, bah. <laughs> Friends, no, God sees it from, from a mile. And nothing surprised him. And I believe all of us here were surprised when 2020 happened, when, when the pandemic happened. Friends, I, one thing that really surprised me was the rate of unemployment. It really broke my heart because when I, when I was there in the Philippines, by the way, I was locked in the Philippines for more than seven months. For those of you who know that I constantly travel, 2020 was supposed to be the year that, that, was, that will be so busy for me that even thinking, I don't know if I'm going to survive 2020. And then I got locked down. For seven months, I was not able to travel even outside of our island. You know that the Philippines had 7,641 islands? For those seven months, I only stayed in one of those islands. Just imagine that. So... While I was there, I was looking at the news, I was looking at the, the internet. I was, all I could hear was unemployment. So I checked the unemployment rate during that uh, pandemic, April 2020. And in the Philippines alone, there's 7.3 million unemployed. It's already a third world country. It's already an impoverished country. And now 7.3 unemployment, and it just somehow gave me a, a little bit of depression because hearing from around around us there is a hotel one of the biggest hotels one of the pioneer hotels in my hometown closed down and when we go around to our malls in the weekends friends it's like a lenten season no one's going around and now i heard that our national carrier uh, not national care, but one of the major airlines back in the Philippines just stayed off nearly 10,000 employees. And our major mall, for those of you who have been to the Philippines, if you know SM City, SM is a friend of mine, actually James, Natalie, and John's son. I brought him to the Philippines and then I let him go around our malls. His jaw just dropped. Jam, this is like malls on steroids. Huge buildings, really huge. It's like, it's like a city in itself. It's called, yeah, it's called SFCT. When they call the malls there, they call them city. And those were the stable companies, but they laid off all their probationary workers. Just imagine thousands of families suffered during that time. And when I looked at the, the news, in the Middle East, I'm thinking Middle East, were they also affected? Friends, United Arab Emirates, like 70 plus percent of their population are expats. And when pandemic hit, this expats, it's just like an exodus. They went back to their homes. Businesses went down. 
everything that I thought was stable was shaken. Even the companies that I thought are <laughs> immovable, like airline companies, friends. I'm even thinking if I'll be employed in an airline company, I'll be safe for life. I'll be just like secured, not safe, but secured. Secured for life. But my dear friends, we have seen like crew after crew has been laid off. It was really heartbreaking, my dear friends. And seeing the unemployment rate, I'm sorry to start this in a very, very depressing tone. I promise it will get better. Friends, we looked at employment rate in the U.S. April 16 to 2020, 22 million declared employment. Three weeks later, May 7, it went up to 33 million. Three weeks later, it went to 40 million plus. I stopped researching, friends. It just gets me depressed. And I'm thinking, opportunities are closing down in the land of opportunity. Even you as feeling it. I'm thinking, oh Lord, this is not good, friends. But it showed me that the only way to survive this is to look up. And the only way to go through this is to somehow give in to the plans that he has for us. Friends, I'd like to, I'd like to read this beautiful thought here. When we take into our hands the management of things which we, which we have to do and depend upon our own wisdom for success, we are taking a burden which God has not given us and are trying to bear it without His aid. Friends, if we are trying to bear something without the aid of God, how heavy do you think it is? Listen. We are taking upon ourselves the responsibility that belongs to God. And thus, we are really putting ourselves in His place. Wow. We may well have anxiety and anticipate danger and loss, for it is certain to befall us. And friends, God did not plan for us to carry this burden alone. And that's why 2020 happened to remind you that you are not as strong as you think you are. That we are not as strong as we think we are. But now it gets brighter, friends. Prepare for brightness. It says here, But when we really believe that God loves us and means to do us good, we shall cease to worry about the future. We shall trust God as a child trusts a loving father. Can you say amen to that? Who among you here when you were a child are worried about your rent? You don't, because you know that your father is taking care of us, or your mother is taking care of that. Friends, just imagine our heavenly father is more awesome than our earthly fathers and mothers. And it says here, then our troubles and our torments will disappear, for our will is swallowed up in the will of God. Friends, you know what? This is such an amazing, amazing quote that it brings my, my attention to, to a friend of mine, who was a, a missionary. He's a very young man, younger than me, friends. Of course, every young people is younger than me. Younger than me. And he actually decided to be a missionary in the middle of his medical school. He quit medical school. And his family was not so happy about it. And uh, this guy, he is the, the youngest of the three. By the way, this is a description of their family. His mom was a doctor. The dad was a doctor. The two brothers were doctors. So he's expected to be a doctor. And I believe among the three siblings, he's the most brilliant one. But the tug in his heart, he could not resist. So third year medical school, third year medical school, he could not stop it anymore. He could not contain his desire to follow the Lord's will. So he became a missionary. And every time I see him year after year after year, while he was in medical school, I could saw him. I could see him really getting more and more depressed. He's thinner than me. Do you believe there's someone thinner than me? He's thinner than me, but he, he, he reduces weight almost every year. 
So he could not stop anymore. He followed the Lord's will. And now when he, when he became a missionary, a full-time missionary, his brothers were concerned. His father was concerned. And then COVID happened. Pandemic happened. You know what, friends, back home, everyone's occupation was affected, even doctors. The doctor's pay was somehow delayed for months. I could not imagine why will they be delayed because the healthcare was really thriving. But I don't know what happened back home. The doctor's, what do you call it, stipend or salary, profession fee got delayed. And the only one that's receiving the blessing during the time in the household, guess who? The missionary. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? The one who's not receiving a regular salary came to his family and said, let me know if you need some help. I have some. Isn't it let, let, let me go back to that quote that says, if you have given yourself to God to do His work, you have no need to be anxious for tomorrow. Can you say a louder amen to that? Sometimes we think that this is only a theory. But my dear friends, this is even more real than our reality. God's promise, God's word is more real than the chair that you're sitting on right now. Can you say amen to that? Friends, and this is another beautiful thought that uh, somehow hit me here. And when I looked at what is affecting the world, like what are the things that's affecting the unemployment? The livelihood have been affected. Like back in the Philippines, first thing that got affected, I think, was the tourism. One of our major industries is tourism. Thailand, just imagine Thailand. How many, how many tourists go to Thailand? Tourism industry was affected. Just imagine how many, how many businesses closed down. Services, of course, when tourism industry is affected, services is affected, manufacturing is affected, transportation. And just imagine how many flights were canceled. How many losses? Even just one flight that will not push through. That's a huge loss, friends. But months after months after months, transportation was affected. Entertainment. Friends, even celebrities were suffering. Have you, have you witnessed a concert lately? Maybe virtual concert, but not physical concert. Entertainment, food industry was affected. Agriculture, construction. And then I realized, friends, I asked myself, as people of God, as people of God, what is the source of what keeps us going? What is our livelihood source? And I realized, friends, that as people of God, we live not just by manufacturing, not just by services, but we live by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Can you say amen? We live by every word. We live by every promise that comes out of the mouth of God. And if we dwell so much in the word of God, my dear friends, there's so much anti-stress there. There's so much anti-depression there. And I read this beautiful quote, and I believe that you are familiar with this quote. If you have your Bible with you, please open it with me. By the way, friends, I'm, I'll be using my iPad because my eyes need revival. It's, it's almost dying. So Matthew 6, verse 25. Matthew 6, verse 25. If you have your Bibles with you, please open it with me. If you're there, say Amen. If you're not there, say, wait for me. Okay, we will wait. Okay, you there now? Okay, it says here, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life. Let's stop there. Take no thought for your life. Friends, you know, English is not my first language. So I looked up other versions does this take no thought means? Another version says, do not be anxious. Do not worry. And I copied that, that phrase, take no thought, and put it in the search engine. And guess how many verses came out after that search? 
Can anyone guess how many verses? 300 what? 66. Actually, it's lesser than that. I guess that's, that's talking about fear. This one, it came out seven verses. Seven verses. And by the way, what does heaven mean in the Bible? Perfection, completion. And then I realized, friends, this is what the Lord wants His people to experience. Complete peace. Perfect peace. Remember Isaiah 26, verse 3. Thou wilt keep him in what? In perfect peace, whose what? Whose mind is stayed where? Is fixed on thee. Is stayed on thee. And this is one thing that I realize that God wants us to fix our minds on him through his word. And friends, you know what's the most amazing thing is? Do you have a red letter Bible? I think even our phone apps are red letters, huh? So if you have a red letter Bible, friends, if you look this, this verses up, if you have search engine later on, don't do it right now. We we'll still go on. The seven verses that came out are all written in red. <laughs> you know what that means? Jesus spoke those words. It's Jesus' words that's telling you, do not be anxious for every single day of the week throughout the year. If your eyes are fixed on Jesus, you never will be anxious. Can you say amen to that? Friends, God is just so good. And He gave this illustration. Look at the birds in the air. Look at the lilies of the field. Are they taking care of themselves? And I'm taking care of them, Jesus said. I'm taking care of them. So how much more you? Are you not more precious than these little things are? And friends, this is one thing that people ask me. So Jim, what should I do? Should I stop working? <laughs> should I quit and, and follow what you're doing? And I told, I told them, do not follow me. Follow Jesus. If Jesus tells you to do so, then he will supply your needs. If I'll tell you to do so and your needs are not met, I cannot supply your needs. Let's fix our eyes on Jesus, amen? This is the answer for that question that was asked. So, Jim, what should we do? Go to verse 33, friends. Verse 33, it says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and some of these things will be added unto you. Praise God, there's some people who are listening. What? All of these things shall be what? shall be added unto you. And I believe, friends, if we focus on His kingdom and His righteousness, we will not have anxiety. You know what gave us anxiety? The added things that we were not able to achieve. It's very simple. Seek me first, and added things will follow. But we are too bad when it comes to instruction. We always pursue the added things and expect the same result. That's why we, we still worry. That's why we're still anxious, because we are not following and obeying His Word. Friend, His Word is so simple, but that simple Word has power. That simple Word is as real the chair that you're sitting on is even more real than the chair that you're sitting on right now. Oh, a beautiful thought here. All who have chosen God's service are to rest in His care. Can you give a big sigh of relief? <sighs> All who have chosen God's service are to rest in His care. What a beautiful, beautiful thought, friends. The measure of divine attention bestowed on any object is proportionate to its rank in the scale of being. And where do you fall in that scale? You are there. You're God's masterpiece. You're God's masterpiece. So how much more is the attention that God is giving you? Remember, when He, when he brought disciples mind look at the birds of the air look at the lilies of the field 
do they, do they store for themselves? How precious are they compared to you? This is what Jesus is trying to tell his disciples. And this is what Jesus is still trying to tell to each and every one of us. Shall we still pursue our own dreams? Or shall we stop and start pursuing him? And you know what's the most amazing? Before you could even pursue him, he's already been pursuing you. <laughs> All you have to do is open your arms and receive him. Friends, God is so good. Mm. Oh. So friends, I better, better end this now. I've been talking and talking and talking. So before we pray, there's still a, a few more verses that I'd like to share with you. And it says here, Psalms 33, verses 6 and 9. If you have your Bibles with you, please try to open it with me. Psalms 36. Psalms 33, I mean, verses 6 and 9. If you're there, say amen. Not much amen yet. Psalms 33, verses 6 and 9. Amen. Amen. Okay. Let us start verse 6. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and by the host of them, and the host of them by the breath of his mouth. By the what? By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. Friends, this is how powerful the word of the Lord is more powerful than the stock market, <laughs> more powerful than American government, more powerful than any powers in this world. It spoke. He spoke, and the worlds came into existence. And this is one thing I realize, friends. Most of the time, we operate by the law of this world. I don't know if you get what I'm saying. We operate by the law of this world, Somehow we, we live our lives by the law of this world, and sometimes the word of the Lord seems ridiculous to us. Most of the time, the world's opinion somehow contradicts this. But my dear friends, just imagine how small the world is. <laughs> Even in our justice, in the groups of planets that we are in, in our solar system, thank you, Sharon. In our solar system, just imagine how small the earth is. And now compared to the universe, we are not even dust. And we ridicule sometimes what the word of the Lord says. Just reality check, friends. We are not bigger. We are very insignificant. But God's word has power. Can you say amen? At verse 9, it says, For he spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. He commanded and it stood fast. So whatever that is being declared in that word, it will come to pass. And it's standing fast. And it will, stood until, it will stand until the eternity of time. So there's one thing right now. From what I have learned, there's three conclusions I could declare. That we will have peace in the midst of the storms. Because there will be, there'll be more storms, friends, that we'll be facing. More brutal, more unforgiving. Than what we have experienced in 2020. We will stand still. We will have perfect peace. If, number one, we do not forget what we live for. Friends, we live for the glory of God. Can you say Amen. If we do not forget what we live by, live by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. And lastly, if we do not forget who we live for, we live for Him alone. You do not just live for yourself. You do not just live for your family. You live for Him. You live for Jesus. If you do not forget those three simple things, friends, you will be at peace. You'll have that complete peace. You'll have that perfect peace that God desires you to have. Can you say amen? And lastly, friends, I'd like to bring this up. Oh, this is not last. 
Three more, I promise. Three little things. Signs of Times, April 11, 1892, paragraph 3, it says, If we have a correct knowledge of the character of God, Satan will not be able to overwhelm our souls with doubt and discouragement. Wow. If we have a what? A correct knowledge of the character of God, Satan will not be able to overwhelm our souls with doubt and discouragement. Friends, did you know how many committed suicide during the pandemic? At least 3,000 people every single day. 3,000 every single day. Not, not accumulative in the whole week, every single day and thinking, wow, that is the opposite of Pentecost, friends. Instead of 3,000 people being won to the foot of the cross, 3,000 people were perishing because they have not seen a Savior. They have not known of the one who wants to give them perfect peace in the midst of the storm. Friends, John 17 verse 3, it says, And this is eternal life that they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Friends, people need to know Jesus. Can you say amen? amen? And lastly, promise this is the last. John 16 verse 33. I'll just read this. These things I have spoken unto you that ye might have peace. Ye might have what? That ye might have peace. Because the Lord knows that we will be needing peace. The Lord sees that you will be desperately needing peace in times that you'll be living in. So it says here, in the world, you shall have pandemic. You shall have lockdowns. You shall have coronavirus and maybe more. In the world, you shall have tribulation. But listen, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Friends, how can we be worried? How can we be shaken when the God who's trying to hold your hand is telling you, I have overcome the world. You do not have to worry. Just seek me first. Put everything in your life at the foot of the cross. Put everything in your life on the altar and you will have what I want you to have. My dear friends, as we come to our knees this evening, this afternoon, I would like to encourage you to gather together as families. For those of you who, who are sitting nearby, if you could gather at least a group of five to seven, let's group ourselves together and let us, let us ask, let us praise God first. Before we go into asking, take note. Before we go into asking, let us praise God that he has safely gotten us through 2020. Can you say amen? That is a very, very weak amen, friends. That's something to celebrate. We are here, 2021, and we are here. Can you say amen? Amen. Amen, <laughs> amen. yes. So, friends, let us praise God. Praise him for who he has been to you, for who he is, especially during those times that you needed him. And as we come before him, there's just two things. Let's just this time praise him and let us ask that he will draw us closer to him. That he will pour upon us his spirit. That this year will be a year of revival for us. And we'll see God's spirit pouring upon us. Amen? So I will, I will lead you into this. As we go into our time of, 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 of praises, I will let you know that it's praises. Again, I will sing a song. If you know the song, sing along with me. And uh, after my short prayer, it will be your time to pray short prayers. How long? Short, like my height, short prayers. Okay? Short prayers, like one or two sentences. You could go back and forth. The five of you, because we will have just two or three minutes in doing this. 
And if you're done praising, if you have, if you have prayed out, just pray silently until we go into our next section. But if I have not sang a song, you could just go on praising God and thanking God. And in our last section, let us ask that the Lord will pour His Spirit upon us. That this revival will start in our hearts, in our churches, in our families. Amen? So for those of you who are able to kneel down, please kneel down with me. But for those of you who have difficulty kneeling down, just turn to the person behind you or turn to the... Just gather yourselves by five, by seven, and let's come together in prayer.